not hewn from blessings. Jesus, you don't owe us anything more than anything that you can do. We just Just gone through the motion through sorrow. And you just sang another song to take us back to where we started. You open up our heart to you. Father, we say we're sorry. Want your spirit to move in this place? Just rain down. Oh, just.
It's your breath in our love, so we pour out our blessings. Great are you, Join the earth and praise and bless me. All the earth will shout your praise. Our hearts will cry, these bones will sing.
for your spirit. we invite your presence into this place and we thank you for filling us he's made a way even where there seems to be no way you've come through and I didn't know my way out I just want you so Lord we thank you and we bless you for making a way
pharmaceuticals. The song is for those who battled against cancer and diabetes, all sickness and disease. And yet, Lord, we're still here. We're still here. <laughs> I'm still here. I could have been dead or gone, but I'm still here. Thank you that the headache wasn't an aneurysm. Thank you that the heartburn wasn't a heartache. Lord, I bless your name because I'm still here. In spite of all that I've been through, you still made a way.
Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. Yeah. Before we pray, I just want to say a few things to you. The first that I would say to you is, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. It really is good. With everything that is wrong in the world, this is what is right in this moment. Can I get an amen? Yeah. The second thing I want to say to you is that I am so appreciative for all of you, those of you online and those of you in the sanctuary. It's been a brutal, it's been a tough year for everybody included. And here we stand a year plus later, knowing greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Can I get an amen? Yeah. You know, the verdict came out this week with Derek Chauvin and justice was given and yet, at the murder of George Floyd, here we stand, committed to continue the fight, believing that at the foot of the cross, every individual is equal because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the, and the beauty of the gospel of the message of Jesus. Amen? I want you to know that they, there are those out there saying that the multi-ethnic church it can't make it. There are those out there saying it should implode. And I'm here to declare to you that we should have imploded this past year. And I know that it was tough. And I know there were moments that there was conflict. I call it a glorious mess. But here we stand with the proof, not because of us, but because of him, that the power of Jesus is able to do that which the world cannot understand. And so I wanna encourage you today that we will keep on keeping on. You see, the key is relationship and trust. I'll say it again. Relationship, which is hard for all of us, and trust. And when those things happen, we'll be able to get and be intentional with people that don't look like us, don't think like us. And then we come together under the common denominator, Jesus. Pastor Curtis has been offering a class over and over again, multi-ethnic conversations. I, I, I think we need to, we don't have enough people signing up for it. Some of you um, uh, that have been engaged with it, you need to get engaged with it again. We need people of color that have gone through it to get it through it, to go through it again, possibly. You may say, well, I'm living it. I don't need to go through it. We need to get into a safe place where we can talk with one another and ask real questions and create um, um, authentic relationships and real trust. Are you with me, church? And so I want you over the next week, there's gonna be on the website and there's gonna be on my KCC app. If you're interested in, in conversational, multi-ethnic conversation speak, um, times, 
you'll see that list, you'll see that sign up. We will offer a class only if you engage. But I am believing that this is the time. We've done it over the past. Some of you have been thinking about it, but I'm here to tell you we need it all the more, whether you've done it before or not. We come together in this time. I believe in this. Anybody else with me? Yeah. I say to folks, we're neither white, we're neither black, we're neither Asian. We are the body of Christ coming together in this incredible beauty of Jesus. Second thing I would say to you today is COVID has uh, caused a lot of struggle. Well, how we're going to worship and how we're going to space and what about masks? Let me just clearly say to you today that we've practiced Philippians 2. That's our reading for today, by the way, in the Epistle Connection, where the Apostle Paul says to us that we should think of the needs of our brothers and sisters above our own. That's all we've tried to do here. It doesn't matter whether you agree or disagree. It's about thinking about somebody else rather than your own. And so we're in the middle of that where I've said to you, keep praying for us and thank you for your patience as we've gone through this. We're not oblivious to keeping things as they are forever. That's not my desire. Nobody enjoys this, but we're moving in as more people are vaccinated as we continue on. Even this week, we opened up another section in the back that is mask free. We will continue to open those up as more people are vaccinated and we're continuing to allow that. We're walking through this thing as best as we can. Would you be patient with us? Would you continue to believe that we're gonna try to figure this out together, yeah? And the third thing I would say to you is that we believe the Holy Spirit wants to meet with us in a powerful way. So you know that I've invited you to come 15 minutes early with your kiddos. If you don't have kids, come and pray at the altar. Pray through the service. We wanna have service before service. We want our visitors to come in and say, what is this place? Why is the Holy Spirit here? If you prepare your hearts together, let's come and experience the Holy Spirit. I'm asking you to sacrifice 15 minutes on a Sunday morning to come and what would happen if we were all truly unifying and praying. If you don't know how to pray, come and just learn how to pray and watch people pray. What a beautiful option. Next week, we're gonna start a new series that I'm excited to be preaching. We're gonna be um, preaching about the book of Philippians and I'm gonna ask you to do something that we've stopped doing. I'm gonna ask you to bring your Bibles to church. Your physical Bibles. I know it's convenient to bring your devices, but we're gonna have them open in our laps. And we're gonna look in the next four weeks through that as we, as we look and get into God's word. Invite people out as we engage today, amen? I'm gonna ask Brenda to come on up. She's gonna translate as we pray in French. And I'm gonna ask you to get comfortable as you pray. I want you to either sit, stand, and or kneel as you feel comfortable as we pray. There are several things that we need to be praying for as a church. First, as you know, India has been decimated by COVID. Decimated. They are dying by the thousands. They are literally out on the concrete. No oxygen. Uh, no, hospitals are completely full. And I've had many. I've had probably five to ten Indian brothers and sisters emailing me all week long. Please ask the church to pray for us. It is it is critical at this point. Can we do that this morning? Pray for the country of India and the devastation of COVID that is happening as we worship. Secondly, we need to pray for the tragedy that happened yesterday in Baghdad. 82 people died in, a, in an explosion at a COVID hospital. 82 people in that explosion. We need to pray for all of those affected. Yes, we've got our stuff in the United States, but it's a lot bigger than us. Are you with me? There's seven billion people on this planet. Let's pray and ask God to bless us and bless them and engage in Him. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, we love you. Nous vous we need you. Nous avons de vous. We ask today On that you would come and be with us. Que vous pouvez venir et soit avec nous. We are weak, but you are strong. Nous faibles, mais vous êtes très, très today we pray for India. On prie pour we pray today for the government there. On prie pour le gouvernement là -bas. We pray that you would send a help to the people that are suffering there this very moment. We pray today for Iraq and Baghdad. On prie aujourd'hui pour Irak et Bagdad. We pray for all of those families affected by that explosion today. On prie pour toutes les familles qui sont impliquées avec le problème là-bas. We pray you'd send your spirit on those that are hurting this very moment. On prie que vous allez envoyer votre esprit pour les gens là-bas. Lord, we pray for our own country and ask you would bless the United States. 
Nous prions aussi pour notre pays et on prie que vous allez bénir ce pays, les États-Unis. We pray you would bless our own state of Michigan. On prie que vous allez bénir cet uh, état du Michigan. We pray that you would bless our church called KCC. On prie que vous allez bénir cette église qui s'appelle KCC. We pray that you would bless our families that are here today. On prie que vous allez bénir tous les familles ici aujourd'hui. We pray that you would bring us together as one. On prie que vous allez tous ramener ensemble comme une. We ask that you would make us one as Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are one. We need you, Lord. We need you today. We need you this moment. Holy Spirit, come upon us. Holy Spirit, come upon us. We give you this moment. We give you this hour. We give you our hurt and our pain. We give you our questions and our doubts. We give you our sin. We ask now that you would fill us with yourself. We love you. We love you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, O oh Lord. We cannot wait for your return. We fix our eyes on you. Our hope is in you alone. So come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. and amen, and amen. amen. Church, amen. would you rise on your amen. feet together and put your hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords as we continue to worship him this morning. Let's worship him, church. Worthy, worthy. We are able to praise. 
him in many languages. I'm excited. Let's all do this together. excited to worship with you, whether you're online or in person. We are so excited. And um, just go ahead and take a seat. We're going to go ahead with the rest of the worship service. Thank you for being here. Hallelujah to the Lamb. I done heard some of y'all clap and cheer louder at basketball games on the TV than y'all did for Jesus just now. So let's do that again. <laughs> Hallelujah to the Lamb. Let's go. Oh, we're not going to half step on the Lord this morning. I ain't going to let y'all do that. Not today. Not on my watch. Not while I got the mic. So y'all might as well just change that up. We can do that one more time. Hallelujah to Jesus. One more time. Welcome everybody in the house today. Welcome to those of you who are watching in the comforts of your living room or in your bed, mattress ministry as you might be having it. My name is Eddie Ward. I get the pleasure of just bringing a few announcements to you today. For those of you who may be new to KCC or you've been coming here and you just haven't really got on board, you should probably download the My KCC app right now, which is available on all your platforms. A couple of reasons why. One, we want you to check in. Two, you need to know what's kind of going on in the church. Three, we want to know what's going on in your life. Maybe there's some, uh, some uh, prayers that you need uh, or some praises that you want to celebrate. Our staff looks at each and every one of those and does those with you, follows along with your life. So make sure you do that. I know y'all are used to seeing me come up here and be up here for like 22 minutes giving announcements and stuff, but not today. Today I'm up here very briefly, very, very briefly. That's it. I'm almost done. Mick's not going to come up here and tell me I'm closing like a preacher today. That's not going to happen. But I do want y'all to put your hands together for the bringing of our tithes and offerings. Again, if you're new to KCC, you're new to watching us online, you might be like, why are these people clapping for no reason? We aren't clapping for no reason. We're clapping for a reason. We cheerfully give back to God what he so graciously gave to us. And we do that cheerfully. A uh, couple of ways that you can participate in that act. One. Uh, you can do so through the MyKCC app. Two, uh, you can also do that uh, here in the house at the back uh, in the giving boxes. You can also use the text number on the screen to give as well. And last but not least, ah, dang it, I did it anyway. Last but not least, <laughs> some of y'all knew, y'all trying to figure out what that's about. You need to go back and watch uh, four services ago when I was up here. Go back and watch the old service if you haven't. Uh, if you want to give from your home and you need envelopes to send in, uh, call our office. Uh, Julie is great, and we'll make sure she gets those envelopes over to you. Amen. And if you're here or at home and you're in help, need of help, assistance, reach out to the church. Don't try to do this life by yourself. It's not the way to go. Church has resources and maybe can give you some direction that can help get you through whatever it is that you might be going through. Amen. Amen. All right. 
Why don't y'all give it up for Mick as he comes back up to the stage. Why don't you guys come on on, Rex and Brenda, come on up here. I want to give two quick announcements as they do. The first is that um, May 8th, women, there's going to be a conference here at KCC called Walking in Renewal. May 8th, it's going to be 11 to 2, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can go to my KCC app to get tickets and learn all about that. There's only 50 seats available, women, May 8th. I encourage you to do that. The rest will be virtual, I think, via Facebook. I would encourage you to engage that. Secondly, to you men, starting this Saturday, we're going to start our 9 a.m. men's breakfast slash Bible study. Yeah. So if you weren't able to be at the last one, we're going to be going every Saturday moving forward. I'm going to start with the Gospel of Mark. Bring your Bibles, bring your uh, journals, um, bring an appetite. We're starting in Ground Zero over on the other side of the building. If you're new to KCC, I want to invite you out for that. Every Saturday, 9 a.m. Let's do this, men. I wondered, I heard Eddie, I didn't know if he any other men were in the house. That's, yes, he's loud enough for all of y'all. This Saturday, starting that, I encourage you out for that. Well, Rex and Brenda are our resident missionaries to Mozambique. They're going to be leaving in, uh, for two months here shortly. Um, they've shared on multiple times about their ministry. I want them to do that uh, again in, this morning and share a little bit about that. But before I do that, I want you to understand that we, about uh, several months ago, started what we call Faith Promise. That is simply where we have decided we are going to give above our tithe, not in, addition, not in, spite, not a, in place of our tithe, that we would ask God what amount he would give us to give over the next year for international missions. And we would give over that course of the year. You can join us if you haven't started that. That money goes towards international ministry. The Brewers are exactly a part of that. We call that faith promise. This is your faith promise in action. You guys are leaving in a, a, a short while. And I know there's some ways that KCC can get engaged. I want you to share a little bit about that and what you do. I also want to, before I forget, they're going to be on virtual this uh, Tuesday at 7 p.m. Again, you can go to my KCC app. We've been doing that when missionaries have been on the platform. I got to say to you, we've only had about 15 people chime in. You need to chime in. Go to my KCC app, get the app, uh, you'll see the thing, and then you'll get a link, and you can sit at, the, at your, at your um, couch or in your house somewhere, and then learn a little bit more detailed about our missionaries. This Tuesday at 7 p.m., go to my KCC app, you'll be able to engage that. But guys, why don't you, I know that KCC is your home, many folks know you, but tell us a little bit about your ministry in Mozambique and how KCC can get engaged. Well, first of all, we want to thank you, KCC, for your ongoing support to the refugee camp that we are helping with your help in northern Mozambique. So uh, on the screen behind us, you'll see some pictures of the camp. Uh, and so about 10 years ago, God opened the door for us to go to Mozambique. And so we stepped out on faith, not knowing what to expect. And our hearts were broken for what we saw, the poverty, the disease, the despair and the hopelessness. So we knew that God wanted us to keep going and we've been taking small teams there ever since. I became friends with a widow named Mama Maombi. She has six children and three grandchildren that she cares for in the camp. And as we spent more time in the camp, we realized she is typical of 80% of the families in the camp. They're led by widows with large families. 50% of the camp population are children under the 15 years of age. And so God is very clear in James 1.27. He tells us to care for the widows and orphans in their despair. And that's primarily who we're helping in the camp. So how do we help them? Well, they're sick all the time. And so they have preventable diseases like typhoid and cholera and dysentery. So God brought us a program called Community Health Evangelism. And we were able to bring trainers over to Mozambique to the camp and they train them in practical techniques that will help them reduce their, their illnesses with proper sanitation and hygiene. Another big problem is hunger. They go to bed hungry every night, and they get hungry every morning, and it's worse because of COVID. So we asked the camp leaders, if there's one thing we could do to help this camp, what is it? And they said, help them build home gardens so people could grow their own food. So far, they built 40 gardens for the widows, and right now they're building a community garden. Yeah. 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 
And it's, it was really, it's really been working. We have many pictures, you'll see some on the screen, of widows who have gardens. But what the problem is, is there's lack of water. When the dry season came, it lasts for eight months in this country. And so many of the gardens died. And so we knew that we needed to find a better solution, a long-term solution for water. So again, thank you, KCC, because through KCC missions, we were able to provide money for them to, to drill. Right now, they're being installed four deep water wells. That's awesome. And thank you to many of you, because many of you gave personal donations as well. And we're very grateful for that. And they realize that once these are in place, they will have drinking water and they will have gardens year round. We don't want you to think that we've solved all the problems in the camp because there's still many issues. They have horrible health care. They have terrible education. And they have no jobs. So what can we do to help them with these situations? We realize that really the answer is through God. So uh, we, we remind them of Jeremiah 29, 11, where God says, I will never forsake you. I have plans for you to give you hope and a future. So we are just asking that God will give us guidance. And through your prayers and your ongoing support, we'll be able to be the hands and feet of Jesus and give them hope and a future. Amen. 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 Thank you. You know, uh, Mick, one thing that um, fascinates us is the, is the reach of the Wesleyan International Church about four years ago. We found out that there was a, a little Wesleyan church in the refugee camp in Mozambique. This tiny wood and stick structure and a handful of believers. This place had blown down a couple of times and the winds that come through. And we were there and we thought, we can do better than this. So thank you, KCC. Thank you, KCC Missions. Pastor Rich Avery, who's really been our advocate. This year, they're going to have a new church made of durable materials that's going to last for a long time. Awesome. Amen. Yeah. All right. So, but uh, the Wesleyans aren't the only church that we, that we help. We've given Bibles to all the churches, and we want to bring in more Bibles because everybody is asking for a Swahili Bible in their heart language. They haven't ha been able to read Scripture in their heart language for many years. Um, so hopefully that um, we'll be able to do that. You know, uh, some of you might have seen out in the lobby and in the east lobby, we have some bins. We're, we're having a tie and scarf drive. And we want to, you know, collect scarves and, and ties to bring to them because, you know, the women just love these lightweight, colorful scarves and the ties. They, they confer dignity to the men, so we bring these. And you wouldn't believe the, the joy that comes from a piece of cloth, but it's a way to tell them that, you know, I see you, God sees you, I remember you, and God is remembering you. So... Our prayer for them is the same prayer that the Apostle John had for the church in 3 John 2. He said, Beloved, I pray that in all things that you prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. So that's our prayer for them. Amen. And you know what? That's our prayer for you too. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Stay right here, real so quick. So, KCC, I don't know if you heard that. You got a little time, you got the bins out there. Men, some of you haven't been wearing a tie for a long time. You don't need to spend any money. Go grab your ties, put them in the bins. Women's scarves, I'd love to see those bins so full simply because we care and engage the folks in Mozambique. Can we do that? Those of you online, be sure you come to the church, help us, and get that going. Here's what I want us to do, church. Extend your hands forward. We're gonna pray a blessing over the brewers. Lord Jesus, thank you for this amazing couple. Thank you for their desire to say, our life will count not only in West Michigan, but around the world. Now they found themselves in this season of life being the hands and feet of Jesus to um, folks in Mozambique. I pray that you would bless them, their travels as they leave, as they spend time there and minister, keep them healthy physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. May your spirit go before them. May we truly experience your power. We're grateful for their lives. We celebrate them. And we pray that we'd learn more on Tuesday night, that many will, um, I pray you'd prompt many to go to my KCC app, get the uh, invitation, get the link, and come in and hear their story more deeply. We love you, and we love them, and we bless them in the mighty name of Jesus. And all God's people said, KCC, put your hands together for the brewers. Thank you so much.
I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, and welcome Pastor Debbie and Lindley as they bring the Word of God. Good morning, KCC. How are you this morning? It is so good to see you. You look wonderful. Good morning to those of you who are joining us online. I can't see you with my physical eyes, but I feel you with my spirit, and I'm so glad that you are here with us. Let us go to the word of the Lord. Our text today comes from the uh, book of Joshua. So if you have it on your uh, device or have your Bible with you, if you will, turn with us to Joshua chapter 1, and we are going to read verses one through nine. Lindley is gonna serve the role as the congregation and lead the congregation to help those who are online be able to read with us. You ready, Lindley? Yes. All right, let's do it. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Starting in verse one, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, verse two, Moses, my servant is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over to this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. Verse 3, every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. Verse 4. From the wilderness in this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your territory. Verse 5, no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6. Be strong and of good courage, for to this people you shall divide as an inheritance to the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Verse 7, only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This... Uh, of the luck shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. And can we just veer from our normal uh, routine, and will we all read verse 9 together and read it from your heart? Let's do it together. Have, have I, I not, not commanded, commanded you? you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Thus is the reading of the word. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of the word and the Holy Spirit empower the doing of the word. Can I get an amen? Thank you very much, Lynn Lee. You can go to Real Kids. You all may have a seat. That's the sermon right there. If you internalize that, then you've got the point uh, of the sermon. It's always a pleasure to stand before you. I'm always very appreciative to Pastor Mick when he gives me this opportunity. I don't take it lightly. Um, pastors take their pulpits very seriously and they don't allow just anybody to get up there. And so I thank, uh, I thank him, thank his trust and uh, depend on the Lord to do the work this morning. Will you go with me before the Lord in prayer for just one second? Father, we first of all just say thank you we thank you that you are already in our midst. We thank you that you have a plan for our lives. Lord, that you have given us, Lord, hope and a future and that your plan for us is for good and for evil. And we thank you, Father, for faith, Lord, that you said if we just had faith the size of a mustard seed, that it would move mountains. And so, Father, we open our hearts. We prick our ears to hear your word. Hide me behind the cross so that we only see you, Father. Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And if you agree with me, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Well, we've had a series that started last week with uh, Christian, our next gen pastor, and didn't he do an awesome job talking about faith overcoming doubt through the life of Abraham? He brought it down, and so I'm going to continue uh, today, Faith Overcoming Doubt, talking about the life of Joshua, and I want to focus on a specific characteristic or attribute of Joshua, that is his fighting 
Spirit. Before we talk about Joshua, and I'm going to walk you through some of the highlights. I'm going to give you a 30,000 foot uh, um, uh, overview of Joshua's life, and we're going to glean some things as we go over it. But before I do that, uh, I want to stop and take a moment to point out how important this series is. I thank God that our pastor listens to the Holy Spirit, because in this time and in this day, having our faith intact is more important than ever. The enemy is going about doing everything that he can to pick away at our faith, to try to get us to doubt about this or doubt about that. And the, the world is full of reasons to doubt today, man. We're, we're still in the midst of COVID, and even though the number of vaccinations are going up and the number of cases overall across the nation are going down, right here in Michigan, the number is going up and it's plateaued a little bit, but it's been stubborn. So we're still in the midst of the pandemic, and many of us are dealing with the tragic loss of loved ones and friends as a result of COVID and even other reasons over this last year. And there's been, of course, the... the uh, uh, the, the dilemma of do I get vaccinated or do I not get vaccinated? Is it safe or is it not? Is it changing my DNA or is it not? And all of the uh, misinformation and all of the predicament around that. And then of course there's the racial unrest and, and there is uh, the politics and there's all these things, fractured marriages and wayward children and shaky finances and mass poverty and injustice and distractions. The enemy is using using anything that he can to get us to doubt and to waver in our faith. Well, I want to pull back the curtain on the enemy and, and, and read his mail before you today and let you know that the reason he's coming after you and coming after me to try to shake, shake our faith because he knows that if he can get us to stand back and sit down and not have faith, that he can then steal, kill, and destroy what God has said is already ours. He knows that you have the victory. He knows that you're an overcomer. And so he he uses every tool in his toolbox to get you to shrink back from your faith. Well, I'm standing here today with all the strength that God has given me and declaring to every devil in hell, not so. We are going to stand in the faith of God. We are going to receive the promises of God. Our children are going to, names are going to be written in the Lamb's book of life. Our spouses are coming back home to love us. We are going to live and have life and have it more abundant and why can I say that with so much confidence? Because I have decided to believe that what God has said is true and that he is a man that he will not lie. And when he says something, it will be for eternity and it lasts longer than you and me. Because he has spoken life over you, you will live. Because he has spoken health over you, you will have health. Because he has spoken over you, it is true in the name of Jesus. Now I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm preaching the last page. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's why Ephesians uh, 6 tells us, why Paul tells uh, the Christians at Ephesus that we are to take the shield of faith that quenches the fiery darts of the enemy. I love that. Our faith not only protects us from the darts of the enemy, but it, it puts the fire out. It quenches the darts of the enemy. That's why our faith is so important. I'm here to tell you, in a walk as a believer in the kingdom of God, your faith is essential, not optional. It is not an alternative, an alternative that you can choose. It is absolutely an essential. As a matter of fact, Hebrew 11.6 11, says, says it this way, that, but without faith, it's impossible to please God because we, believe, we have to believe that he is in order to come to him and believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So let me just tell you this, faith is not an earthly construct. It's not natural. Faith is spiritual. That's why sometimes it's hard to lay hold of it. As a matter of fact, Paul says that if you can see a thing, it's not faith. Why would you need faith if you can see the chair? 
Faith is for those things that we cannot see, right? We all know the definition of faith put forth in he Hebrews 11.1. 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that we cannot see. You see, faith is a decision. It is not a feeling. It is not anything that we can touch, taste, hear, smell, or see. Faith is a decision. You decide to believe God. You decide that he is good for his word. You decide to pray. You decide to read the word. You decide to hold your tongue when you want to curse somebody else. You decide to love somebody when you want to backslap them across the room. Faith is a decision. And you don't have to feel it in order to have it. I tell you what, just a couple of days ago, uh, a few days ago as I was preparing this message, I knew that there was something that the Lord wanted for us because the enemy was railing against my sermon prep. I lost my sermon twice on my computer. I had to write this doggone thing three times because I lost it twice. And when that happened, it didn't make me upset. It didn't make me uh, um, <clears throat> um, discouraged. I refuse to cower before the enemy, not because I'm so great, I am nothing. All but the God that I serve is everything. And, and when it happened a second time, I didn't get sad, I got upset. I got mad at the enemy. I'm like, uh-uh-uh, not today, uh, enemy. And I went back to write and I was like, well, apparently what I started the first two times wasn't right. So I'm gonna do it right this time. I made the decision to press through. I wanna encourage you, no matter what is coming against you in your life today to get upset with the one that you should be getting upset with. Your husband is not the problem. Your child is not the problem. Your boss is not the problem. Your reeky dink car is not the problem. Your half empty bank account is not the problem. It's the enemy of your soul that's the problem. So make the decision to have faith in God and stand up against the wiles of the enemy. Can I get an amen? All right, I was asked to preach on Joshua. So let's talk a little bit about who Joshua is and what he demonstrated in his life uh, in terms of faith overcoming doubt. Now, we most commonly associate Joshua with two, I think, aspects of his life. First of all, we know that he was the assistant to Moses, right? And that he was then determined to lead uh, the children of Israel into the promised land, which we're gonna talk about much more in just a second. We also know, we know that famous battle, right? That when they went into the promised land, first battle they fought was at Jericho. We all can remember that song uh, from Sunday school. And Pastor Brant, this is for you. Remember that song? Joshua shot the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Woo, Joshua shot the battle of Jericho and the walls came. Yeah, you remember that one from Sunday school, right? That's what we associate Joshua for. But I want to dig in a little deeper because when you go below the surface, you pull out some nuggets that maybe you didn't know before. First of all, Joshua was born, unlike uh, uh, Moses, Joshua was born into slavery. He was born in e Egypt while the children of Israel were enslaved by the Egyptians and by Pharaoh. So he was born into oppression. And you'll remember from your Bible study or even if you just watched Charles, Charleston's Heston movie, The Ten Commandments, that the Hebrews at the time were harshly treated by the Egyptians, that their life was work but they were a hardy people. And even in the midst of the oppression and in the midst of the cruelty, they worked hard and they produced a lot and they had babies. You can tell how strong a civilization is by how many babies that they have. And there's a whole biology lesson behind that. But these, the children of Israel were so hardy that in the midst of all the harshness, and the tough conditions, they were able to still reproduce. Well, this was intimidating to Pharaoh. So Pharaoh then commanded the midwives to kill the babies as they were being born in order to, uh, um, in order to mitigate, to reduce the population of the children of Israel. But because they were becoming so populous, they were approaching the number of Egyptians. Well, the midwives wouldn't do that. And, the, and they kept, they said, well, you know, these, these Hebrew women, they're just something else. By the time we get there, that baby is out. 
We don't know what happened. And then, of, and then of course, we know that then Pharaoh declared that the firstborn or the, uh, the male-born children would be killed. And this is the environment that Joshua was born into. Now, I have to use my imagination to, to uh, extrapolate what that might have been like for a young boy like Joshua. Where as you're growing up, everybody that looks like you is subjugated and oppressed and treated harshly. These group of people that through history had been God, called God's chosen people. Yet when he looked around, he saw nothing but pain and misery. I would imagine, the Bible doesn't tell us this. This is, this is Debbie's imagination. I would imagine that a little child might then wonder, well, who is this God? Or does he even really exist? How could he let us live in these conditions and be his chosen people? Where is this God? Does he really care about us? I could imagine that a young boy growing up in this circumstance could very easily and understandably turn out bitter and cynical and hard and unbelieving. But somehow, that's not how Joshua turned out. So let's pick apart a few things that we know about him to see if we can get some insight into how Joshua had such a, uh, um, a harsh beginning and such a victorious end. The first time Joshua appears in the Bible it is when the children of Israel have left Egypt, gone through the Red Sea that the Lord has parted, and then they have to fight for the first time, and they have to fight the Amalekites. And Moses, the leader of the children of Israel, appoints Joshua as the commander to oversee this battle. Now, you'll remember this battle because this is the battle where the Lord told Moses, as long as you have your hands up, I'll give the children of Israel victory. Remember that? And they, but there were many more Amalekites than there were fighter, Hebrew fighters. And uh, the, the battle went on for so long that Moses got tired and his hands began to sink. And when his hands came down, then the children of Israel, the Hebrew fighters, would begin to lose the battle. So he'd have to raise his hands. But because there were so many of them and the Amalekites were such great fighters, the battle went on and on and, and his hands began to sink. And then eventually Aaron and Hur come and they hold up uh, uh, Moses' arms and the children children of Israel win this battle. Well, it was Joshua that was the leader of this battle. So I imagine in my, in, in my mind's eye that maybe this might have been the beginning of him understanding what faith in God really was, where he saw with his own eyes that when the man of God, Moses, was obedient, then victory was won. And then when he got tired, then they began to lose the victory. And then God sent help for him, and the arms went back up, and they won that battle. I would imagine that began to stir up the seed of faith in him. Not to mention what other natural characteristics that he had that caused Moses to appoint him to be a commander of the army. We later see Joshua then when Moses goes up to Mount Sinai to be in the presence of the Lord and to get direction from the Lord. And you'll remember that. He went up and there was the burning bush. And of course, uh, um, um, Moses, uh, uh, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, right? And they were up there for so uh, long that the, the children of Israel left down in the valley, began to think that he was dead, that God had killed him. And they began to melt all their gold and silver and they erected, uh, erected the golden calf and begin to worship the calf. So we don't know if Joshua was able to hear what God said to Moses. The Bible does not tell us. We don't know what he saw. We just know that he went up to the mountain with him, which meant that he was trusted by Moses, the leader. 
We also know, according to the scriptures, that as they were coming down from the mountain, that jo it was Joshua who heard the celebration and the revelry of the children of Israel as they were down there worshiping the golden calf. So we know that he was close to greatness. We also know that he was attuned. He, he, he had acute hearing. He heard what was going on before he saw it. I would call that in these days discernment. So then the next time we see Joshua, it's when the children of Israel have made a very short trek through the wilderness. They're now at the bank of the Jordan across from the promised land and Moses sends 12 spies into the land to spy it out. And amongst those 12 spies were Joshua and Caleb. And you know the story. They go in, they, they, they uh, look around, and they come back out, and, the, and 10 of the spies says, oh, this land is terrible. There are giants there, people that are twice our size. The, the, the land is harsh. The fruit is even so big we can barely carry it. I find that hilarious that the 10, the ten spies were discouraged by big pieces of fruit but they come back with this bad report. And then we know that Caleb said, let's quickly get up and go. We are well able. God has given us the victory. And of course, uh, Joshua admonished the people to not fear that God would give them the victory. So now we see that not only has Joshua demonstrated uh, qualities and characteristics of a leader that he's been appointed to command, be a commander of the battle and he's been trusted to go up into the mountain with the leader Moses and when he came down, he was the one that heard the children uh, of Israel worshiping another God, cheating on God with you, if you will, and then chosen to go and spy out the land. Now he sees the same thing that the other 10 spies saw, but he comes back with a different report. We see extraordinary faith already in Joshua's life. I wonder why that was. I submit to you today that Joshua's faith overcame the doubt that the 10 spies had because he believed what God said and that what he said was true. Remember, God had already told him at the beginning of the chapter what was going to happen. He said, every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given to you. And then God goes on to say, be strong and of good courage. Know that I will not, be, I will not leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you just like I was with Moses. Now the moment God said that, that informed a whole reservoir of experience. Because not only has Joshua led the battle that defeated the Amalekites, and not only had Joshua gone up to the mountain with Moses and come down and heard the children of Israel uh, um, 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 betraying their oath to God, and not only had he gone into the land with the 10 spies, you gotta remember what else he had seen. He had seen God uh, sustain his people, even under harsh treatment. He had seen God protect his people when the plagues came. He had seen God deliver his people out of the hands of Pharaoh. And even when Pharaoh changed his mind and sent soldiers, chariots to go get them and bring them back, he had seen God split the Red Sea so that they could walk through on dry land. And he had seen God then cause the waters to close back over the chariots and drown the soldiers. You see, Joshua had seen the work of God. And so when God had said, I won't leave you or forsake you, that I will give you the land upon which you tread, he believed God because he had an experience with God. Some of us, our faith is shaky and wobbly because we don't have enough experience with God. Oh, but I tell you, if you'll give God a chance, watch him blow your mind. He tells us, touch me, prove me in this. Have some experience with, some of us need to turn off the talk shows and turn off uh, uh, Fox News and turn off MSNBC and turn off CNN. Now, I was a broadcaster for 25 years and I, I consume a lot of news. I like news, but I don't get my confidence from it. I don't have my worldview because of it. 
Some of us have created whole world views around what we see in mass television and in mass media and in entertainment and even in the conversations that we have at Starbucks and Bigby and it's created our own uh, a view of what reality is. But I encourage you, I'm not telling any of us to be isolationists. We need to be in community with one another. But I'm saying that if you will come away and be in the presence of God and watch him work in your life, you'll be just like Joshua and you'll be able to look back and say, God, you brought me through the Red Sea. I know you're going to part the Jordan for me. God, you fed us when we were hungry then. I know you're going to feed us right now. Faith overcomes doubt when we believe what God says. Now, I can only imagine what it was like to be appointed the successor to Moses. Moses was one of the greatest leaders of all time one of the greatest leaders in the Old Testament. And I don't know what it would have felt like to be appointed to come after Moses. I know if, jo jo if Joshua was anything like me, some insecurity would be in play. I'm like, mm, I can't lead like Moses led. I don't know if I'm up to that task. Yet and still, God told Moses to appoint Joshua as, the, as his successor to take the children of Israel into the promised land. I wonder if Joshua said, I'm not sure if I'm up to this. Or I wonder if when he was appointed, the children of Israel said to Joshua, are you gonna do it like Moses did it? That's not how Moses did it. When Moses was in charge, he did it this way. Yet and still, Joshua stepped into his calling. Now, mind you, he stepped into a calling, into a position behind a man who had seen the glory of God, who had spoken face to face with God, who God had rescued as a baby from the Nile and put him in the Pharaoh's palace. God doesn't tell us, the Bible doesn't tell us that Joshua had any of these kinds of life-changing experiences. But now he's appointed to be the next leader of the children of Israel. Here's the thing. I don't know if Joshua realized it at the time, but it's easy uh, with hindsight for me to see why he was the right man for the job. We don't know that he was anything like Moses. Moses was a leader not necessarily a warrior. Joshua was a warrior. We don't know if he was eloquent in speech. We don't know really what he looked like. We don't know anything about him. But what I do know is that the call that God had on Joshua's life as a leader of the children of Israel was vastly different than the call that God had on Moses' life. You see, Moses was uh, uh, ordained to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. I'm going to say that again. Moses was ordained, appointed to lead the children of Israel out of bondage. Will you just say that with me? Just say out. Put that in the chat, out. However, Joshua was ordained and anointed by God to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Can you say into? Put it in the chat, into. It's one thing to trust God to get you out of a sticky situation. It's something altogether different to trust God to lead you into an unknown situation. We pray all the time, God, get me out of this mess. God, get me out of that mess. But I don't know how many of us pray, God, lead me into this land that is full of giants and that's a harsh land and that there are great warriors. I don't know that we pray like that, but that's what Joshua was assigned to do. In order to have faith that overcomes doubt, we must be willing to move forward into what God has for us, even when we don't know what it looks like. If Joshua had simply duplicated, replicated, imitated everything that Moses has done, had done, I don't know if the children of Israel would have received the promise because it took one skill set to get a group of people out of the situation. 
It took a completely different skill set to get the, the people into what God had for them. Now, I want you to hear me very seriously. We are all waiting to get out of a bad situation. We're standing around waiting on COVID to be over. We're waiting on the mask to fall away. We're waiting on social distancing to be a thing of the past. We're waiting on the economy to ramp up. We've been asking God to get us out of the pandemic, but I'm here to tell you that God has something for you and me that is before us. We can't see it. I don't know what it is, but based on this as the example, we're gonna have to be able to fight for it. So one of the ways that faith overcomes doubt is you gotta trust God as much for getting him, getting you out of something as you trust him for walking into the new thing. The reason Joshua was put into place was he was the man that was to take the children of Israel into the new season. Faith overcomes doubt when we're willing to not only leave what's old and familiar, but to walk into what's new and unfamiliar. Joshua as he uh, then rallies the people, tells them, you got three days, pack up your tents, men get ready, we're about to go into the promised land. They first had to cross the river, Jordan. And I always find it very interesting that he didn't seem to hesitate about that. We're not aware that the children of Israel built any boats in the wilderness. How are they gonna get across the water? There's no time spent in the book of Joshua telling us that Joshua fretted over it. I wonder, did he spend any time wondering how we're gonna cross the river? I tend to think that he didn't spend any time thinking about it because he remembered what God had already done. He had the uh, priest get the Ark of the Covenant and go in front. He told the children of Israel to line up behind them and that they were going to cross the River Jordan. And the scripture tells us that the Lord caused the river to stop running upstream from where they crossed, and they crossed over on dry land. It is so amazing to me that uh, there's no time spent on, do we need boats? Do we need rafts? Is it deep enough? How are we going to get across? I would submit to you, and again, this is Debbie's imagination, but it makes sense to me, that the reason that Joshua did not hesitate to cross the Jordan, to go into the land of Canaan that God had given them, is because he had already see, seen God split the Red Sea. And if God could split the Red Sea, surely he could stop a little bitty river for a little while, to, uh, a little while longer. But some of us need to remember what God has already done for us. What we're facing now is nothing compared to what he's brought us through before. And if we'll take the time to remember, God, you got me out of that situation. I know you're going to get me out of this one. God, you fed us when I didn't know where food was going to come from. I know you're going to feed us this time. God, you healed the relationship before. I know you can put that relationship back together. If you will remember what God has already done. It will give you the faith to overcome the doubt for what he is going to do for you. In fact, Joshua was not, uh, uh, not only remembered, but he was so good at remembering that he set 12 stones for each of the tribes of Israel as, a, as a, uh, a memorial for what God had done for them. It's important for us to remember. Can you say remember? We gotta remember what God has done. Another time, and I'm just kind of gl uh, uh, glistening over some of the high points. Not long after that, they faced the battle at Ai. And they uh, lost the battle first because of some disobedience, because uh, Achan took accursed things, pagan symbols. And, and uh, Joshua finds this out, uh, destroys those things. And then the Bible tells us in chapter 5 that he is confronted by the commander of the army of the Lord. We presume an angel, a spiritual being. And Joshua says, are you with us or are you against, uh, against us? And the, the commander of the army of the Lord say, uh, doesn't say he's with or against, but this is what Joshua does. He asks God, what do we do now? Tell me what to do. He asks God for instructions before taking action. All too often, we decide to take action and then we just ask God to bless it. We decide to marry that knucklehead, and then we're asking God to keep the marriage together. We decide to get that degree, and then we're asking God for a job in that discipline. 
We decide to take this new career leap and then we ask God to uh, prosper it. I got a tip for you. Ask God first. Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? I've, I've told you uh, uh, many stories about my mom before. I used to laugh at my mother because she literally did ask God for everything. And as a little girl, I would laugh at her and I'm like, I don't know why you bothering a big old God of the universe about where your car keys are. If you had remembered where you put them, you wouldn't have to bother him about that. But God was faithful and she'd always find the car keys. I remember going to her, I had to do a, a book report and stand before the class uh, um, uh, for an assignment. And I, this was back in the 70s, I'm a child of the 70s, and I had a polka dot outfit and I had a plaid outfit. Y'all remember the 70s, right? Those of you who are old enough and you know, remember the platform shoes. And then I remember those guys that had those really high platforms that had a goldfish swimming around in there. That was the time that I grew up in. So I had my loud polka dot outfit, my loud plaid outfit. And I went to my mom uh, one morning before school and I said, mommy, which outfit should I wear before, uh, while I give my presentation? And do you know what she said to me? Thank you, Eddie. She said, let's pray about it. See what the Lord says. I was so frustrated. I'm like, God don't care. But now again, I was a child of the 70s. So, you know, children did not speak to their parents in that way. So I, all I had, to, all I really could do was just comply. And we prayed. And I remember my, my Lord, my mother prayed. She said, Lord, Holy Spirit, show Debbie which outfit to wear. And I'm like, oh, come on. And then she had the nerve. I didn't realize that she was helping me with my own spiritual formation at the time. Then, she, so she prayed, God lead her and help her to do well and all the other things that she prayed. And then after she prayed, she looked up, to, up at me and she said, what did God tell you? Now I was like 12, 13 years old. And I'm thinking, mm, God told me to tell you to tell me which outfit to wear. <laughs> I don't really know what I said to my mom, but she, she was teaching me to listen for the voice of the Lord. Before you do anything, listen, listen for the voice of the Lord. Ask him, wake up in the morning, God, what are we doing today? Where are you sending me? A part of our family discipline, we play, pray at least twice a day, every day together. And a part of our family discipline in the morning is I pray, God, you show us where you want us to go. Holy Spirit, you tell us what you want us to say and teach us what you want us to do. We want to be in your will today. Because when we acknowledge the Lord, he then will direct our path. And here's the thing, it might seem insignificant for you, but what you can't see is the end. God sees the end from the beginning. And to you, it might be inconsequential whether you're a business major or a, a nursing major. But God might have a plan and a purpose for you where your major would make a big difference. It might seem insignificant to you whether you take the belt line or, or you come on East Paris. But God might have uh, something to protect you from or something for you to do depending upon that uh, a route. So ask God for instructions. That's how we... Our faith overcomes doubt. Another time, Joshua then was fighting on behalf of the Gibeonites. And you learn then in chapter 10 and chapter 9 that Gibeon comes to, the Gibeonites come to Joshua and the children of Israel because they've heard about all the great victorious uh, feats that they've done. And they're great fighters. They're, they're winning every battle. And they don't want the Israelites to defeat them. So they come to them and they put on tattered clothes and they throw dust on themselves. And they say, we've come from a foreign land and we need protection. Would you make a treaty with us to protect us if we're ever attacked. And they, de they deceived the children of Israel to get this treaty. Well, then they eventually find out, though, that they were not foreigners from a strange land, that they were inhabitants of the land, and they just didn't want the children of Israel to defeat them. Well, because the Gibeonites made this treaty with the children of Israel, other uh, kingdoms around got angry. And about five kings and their armies then banded together to fight the children of Israel to, and, and to defeat the Gibeonites. Well, now Joshua is a man of his word because he says, yes, I'll protect you. Now he has to fight not just one nation. He's got to fight a whole host of them, half a dozen of them. And they were outnumbered by leaps and bounds. And the scripture tells us that uh, they went into battle living up to the word 
Joshua was a man of integrity, living up to the word that they had given to the Gibeonites, and they fought this battle. And they, I don't know if they were losing or not, but this is what Joshua asked in, in, uh, verse, in chapter 10. He asked God to hold the sun still in the sky to give them time to defeat all of their enemies. The scripture tells us that God held the sun in the sky, elongated the day so that Joshua and the children of Israel could win this battle. And the scripture also tells us this is the only time that God obeyed a man. But this is what I love about this. Joshua's faith demonstrates a commitment to finish what he started. His request of the Lord was not a reflection of him trying to boss God or him throwing his weight around. His request of the Lord was so that he could do what he said he was going to do. He said, God, will you just give us day Daylight long enough so that we can defeat this enemy and the Lord did it so Joshua was a man of integrity but he was also a man of perseverance willing to finish what he started the scriptures tell us then in Joshua uh, um, chapter 10 and on that the children of Israel defeated every enemy and God gave them rest in the land so we're rounding out to the end of Joshua's life. And in verse 24, after Joshua has lived in subjugation and in slavery and then come out of slavery and seen the Red Sea part and, uh, and defeat the Amalekites and then seen God provide food when the children of Israel complained because they were hungry, provided manna, and when the manna wasn't good enough to provide ravens, and then when they got thirsty, saw God then provide water, and then saw uh, uh, God be uh, faithful to them that their clothes didn't wear out and their shoes didn't wear out. He'd seen the faithfulness of God. And through all of this, God was saying, serve me and me alone. Do not serve the enemies. Uh, do not serve the gods of your enemy of the foreign lands. Don't marry into them. So after uh, Joshua has fought all these battles, won all these battles, been true to his word, uh, persevered in what God had called him to do, at the end of his life, he does not run a victory lap saying, woohoo, look how God used me. Those were not his last words. His last words to the children of Israel were this. In chapter 24, verse 14 and 15, he says, now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua demonstrates how faith overcomes doubt by living a life that is upright and holy, set apart before God, refusing to compromise with how the world does things. The bottom line is Joshua was a fighter. So I'm here to say to you today that God is calling us, just like Joshua, to face and to fight the giants that are in our lives. Sickness, death, doubt, depression, idolatry, racial oppression, apathy, lust, confusion in our identity. God is calling us to fight. We need to be like Joshua in that we listen to God. We ask him for instruction. We obey what he tells us to do. We stay on mission until the mission is completed. Here's the thing, here's my final question as I begin to close. Are you ready to fight? Are you ready to fight for your marriage? Are you ready to fight for your children? Are you ready for, to fight for your peace of mind? Are you ready to fight 
for the church of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying literally take up guns and rifles. What I'm saying is that we fight where the battle is because you see the battle, spiritual battles are fought with spiritual weapons. So what I'm asking you, are you ready to be able to stand against the wiles of the enemy? Are you ready to be able to stand against the principalities, the powers, the rulers of the darkness of this age, the spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places? Here's the good news. You can stand against it because the scripture tells us that our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty in God for the casting down of arguments for, and, and for casting down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of of God. It's time to fight, my sisters and brothers. I know we feel like we've been in a fight, but it is time to fight. And here's the good news. <laughs> I've been waiting this whole sermon to get to this. How do you fight? You fight with the weapons that God has given us. Let me say this first. You fight with the word of God, knowing the word. Thank God for the epistle connection, and we're reading every day, but I encourage you to study too, and not just read the word, but be doers of the word. How do we fight? We fight with praise in worship. I challenge you to get up in the morning and just begin to de declare who God is. Begin to tell him back how great he is. God, you're wonderful. God, you're awesome. God, you're mighty. There is nothing that you can't do. Your name is above every name. You are Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You are Jehovah Rapha, my healer. You are Jehovah Nisi, my banner. You are Jehovah Shalom, my peace. Just begin to declare who God is. You are El Shaddai, the almighty God. You are El Roy, the God who is present. You are El Gomer, the God who performs. You're El Elyon, the most high God. You are Emmanuel, the God with us. You are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. If you will begin to declare the character and the nation, nature of God, he will begin to perform in his his character and in his nature. You fight doubt. Faith overcomes doubt by your obedience, by doing what God says to do. Faith overcomes doubt by persevering in what God has called you to do. Don't back up, don't give up, don't sit down, don't turn away, don't peter out, stand. The scripture tells us having done all just to stand. Now I hear you, I hear you in my spirit. There are some people who are hearing me and you're tired. You have been fighting, and it seems like things are not changing. It seems like things are not getting better. I encourage you to just stand. Put on the whole armor to protect you from the attack of the enemy and stand in the promises of God. And the standing is your fight. Because here's the thing. Huh. In the kingdom of God, yes, we do have to decide to fight. But here's the awesome thing, and we see it in Joshua. All we gotta do is obey and step into the fight. Because God has already given the victory. We don't have to win, we just gotta fight. I wanna say that again, we don't have to win, that's not up to us, that's God's job. We just have to fight. And the enemy has been trying to lure and lull some of us into a state of complacency and apathy and fatigue and tiredness and doubt, knowing that if he can convince us not to fight, that he keeps us out of the promised land. So I wanna, make a call to you today. Thank you, Jesus. Ask God. I dare you to ask him, what do you want me to do, Lord? And if you're not sure where your fight is in your life, ask him, where is the battle? Some of us are looking in the wrong direction. We think our problem is this when it's actually that. Ask the Lord, Lord, where is the battle? And then I'm challenging you to fight spiritually, 
with prayer. I'm praying, Pastor Debbie, pray some more. With the word, I'm reading the word, Pastor Debbie, read some more. With praise and worship, I'm praising, Pastor Debbie, praise some more. Praise God so much that your family gets sick of hearing it. That's how you fight. That's how you fight. And part of the, the way that we fight is to just simply be in the presence of the Lord. We talked about this on Friday night during the night of prayer. Beautiful song on being silent, being quiet. We run from the quietness of being in the presence of the Lord. I encourage you, take some time and just be quiet before the Lord. Wait on him. Because they that wait upon the Lord will mount up on wings like eagles. They'll run and not get weary. They'll walk and not faint. And quietness and confidence is our salvation. So listen for what the Lord has to say. Press in to his word. Live it out. In the epistle connection today, in Philippians, Paul told us to love others and put their interest above our own. How does that live out in your life? Where have you been putting your own ambition, your own interest ahead of others? Ask the Holy Spirit for empowering ability to do that. That's how faith overcomes doubt. And then finally, be intentional about listening to what God has to say. Final lesson from Joshua is, yes, he was a fighter and he was willing to fight and he was good at it. But he didn't ever fight a, bo a battle that God did not tell him to fight. Some of us are in the midst of battles that we were never supposed to be in. That wasn't your battle to fight. I encourage you to extract yourself from those fights. That's why you're not winning. Because when God sends us into the fight, he's already given us the victory. Amen? All right. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you've already given us a promise of victory. And I ask, Lord, that you give us the courage and the discipline to fight the giants in our lives. And we know that you will be with us to give us the victory. But Father, I ask that you gird up every broken heart, every downtrod spirit. Renew strength, renew optimism, renew joy. And Father, we're gonna be so careful to give you all the glory and all the praise. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Debbie. I'm gonna ask those of you at home, if you're able, to go get your elements and the rest of you in the sanctuary to open your elements now as we come to partake at the close of our service of the Lord's Supper. Scripture declares to us who is eligible to take of the Lord's Supper it doesn't matter if you're a member or not a member. It doesn't matter if you're a guest or you call this home. What matters is if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You simply do that by asking him into your life and confessing him as Lord, and that makes all the difference in the world. Would you, break, would you uh, bow your heads with me? Lord, we're grateful today that you are a God that has given us the ability to be free and to have faith as was just preached. And we pray right now that you would enable us to look towards you and what you did 2,000 years ago, to truly be free and to be thankful. In Christ's name, amen. And after three and a half years, the very last time Jesus took the bread with his disciples and he broke the bread. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. 
Every time you take this, do this in remembrance of what I have done. Remember, remember, and be thankful. Amen. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the last covenant. My blood spilled as the last time for your sins. Don't only remember what this represents. And not only be thankful, but also take this in anticipation that I'm coming back to take you home. Do this with a heart that says, I will follow you. Amen. Lord Jesus, thank you again that you're a God that is in control even when we don't see it and to know that you can build our faith. And thank you for what you did on the cross. We honor and we bless you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said. The Lord, you would you please stand with me, church? The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace until we meet again. And all God's people said, amen and amen.